Hey y'all, this is Sarah from the Sarah Carter Show. Thanks for listening to Three Martini Lunch. What happens when we die? From Angel Studios, the force behind Sound of Freedom and The Chosen, comes an unprecedented deep dive into the phenomena of near-death experiences in the new movie, After Death. After Death makes a courageous venture into a hotly debated, mysterious subject by comparing near-death experience with cutting-edge scientific knowledge. Hear from experts in the fields of science, philosophy, and medicine medicine, as well as firsthand experiences of people who have lived through death as they paint a fascinating picture of life in the next realm. This groundbreaking project responds to the soul's innate desire to find meaning in life and solace in the future. Come see it for yourself or pay it forward by providing a free ticket for others to see the film. Leave your preconceptions at the door and prepare for a never-before-seen glimpse into what the next life could entail in After Death, opening October 27th. Get your tickets today or pay it forward at angel.com slash three martini lunch that's angel.com slash three martini lunch after death the end is only the beginning rated pg-13 welcome to the three martini lunch grab a stool next to greg Columbus of radio america and jim garrity of national review three martinis coming up so glad you're with us for the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. As you know, Jim Garrity is away this week, but uh, from everything I know, he's going to be back on Monday. So I haven't heard differently, as you know. And if you've been doing your assigned reading of the Morning Jolt, you know he's in Taiwan giving a perspective you're not going to get anywhere else. We'll be having a full debrief with Jim soon. Not on Monday, but uh, sometime soon uh, here in his place. Today, we're very happy to have uh, Andrew C. McCarthy, former chief assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, contributing editor now at National Review Online and also a Fox News contributor. So, Andy, always great to have you. Thanks for pinch hitting today. Greg, it's great to be here. If You know, Jim's going to keep going out to save the world. The least I could do (laughs) is try to slide into his big shoes. I'm confident that he will be back. Sunday because he wouldn't miss the giant game. The Jets game. Well, exactly. Game. I noticed yeah, I noticed he made this trip coincide with the Jets bye week. I don't think that's a coincidence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think um didn't didn't Taiwan got China to buy into the bye week too, right? There wasn't gonna be an invasion or yeah. That's I right. Remember. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's pretty smart. I just wish I could have been eavesdropping on his negotiations with the Taiwanese officials to explain what a bye week in the NFL are and uh, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, well, China has jets that actually work. So <laughs> the whole the whole conversation was probably difficult, I imagine. <laughs> Speaking of jets, let's talk about U.S. Uh, military jets as we start off here uh, with our good martini. We uh, made the bad martini a couple of days ago. The revelation that a week after the fact, the U.S. was finally admitting that there had been multiple drone attacks on U.S. military positions in the Middle East, Iraq and Syria to be specific. Twenty four U.S. personnel were injured, minor injuries, but that can certainly range and just it's not like the Iranians were aiming for minor injuries. They were they were trying to attack our U.S. position. Well, yesterday, uh, AP with the story, uh, U.S. fighter jets launched airstrikes early Friday on two locations in eastern Syria linked to Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, according to senior U.S. military officials, the precision strikes were carried out near Bukamal by two F-16 fighter jets, and they struck weapons and ammunition storage areas that were connected to the IRGC, which is Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, The official said there had been Iranian-aligned militia and IRGC personnel on the base and no civilians, but the U.S. does not have any information yet on casualties or an assessment of damage. Well, we hope the damage is extensive, particularly with the things we were aiming at. So, Andy, it's a delicate walk that this administration's trying to do. They're trying to keep playing footsie with the Iranians, but you got to respond when your people are under attack from people clearly funded and armed by the Iranians. So uh, what do you make of the Biden administration shooting back here just a couple of days after this went public? Well, it's overdue, as you say, and it's obviously for that reason, if no other, it's welcome. I, I'm concerned, Greg, about the sort of uh, miniaturized nature of the strike under the circumstances where we're not only getting all this information about Iranian proxy strikes on U.S. forces in the region, which the administration tried to keep buttoned up until that was uh, impossible. But the whole fact of the matter is that the Iranians are behind the Hamas attack. 
And this idea that like we have to f- intercept a, a a phone call between the Hamas leadership in its comfy headquarters in Qatar uh, and the Ayatollah before we can conclude what our own eyes are telling us, which is that Hamas is armed and trained by the Iranians and that because uh, an operation of the kind that the Iranians did on October 7th could very well have prompted a response against Iran by Israel, because everybody knows uh, that Iran was behind this, whether Iran ordered them to do it or, you know, gave them official green light to do it. The thought that Hamas would do this without letting Iran know what was going to happen to me is just preposterous. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think we have to recognize uh, as as I think it was H.R. McMaster I heard on a podcast say the other day, when we when um, Iran does what it does, we have to respond and we have to let them know, you know, we know what the return address is on all of this. We know that they're the ones who are behind this. You know, interestingly, you mentioned Jim's great work over in Taiwan. His jolt today was about uh, the crossover uh, and, and increasing ties between uh, Taiwan and Ukraine. And I, I think the interesting thing is the commonality, the common thread uh, in these varying conflicts that we're dealing with is Iran. I mean, every place you look, Iran is you, Iran is allied with uh, China. Iran is allied with Russia. Iran sponsors Hamas and these other proxies that are uh, hitting us. So we know where the problem in the world is coming from. I'm a little bit concerned. I'm actually a lot concerned about the willingness of the administration to deal with that in the way it's got to be dealt with. Uh, which means a vigorous response where we let them know that we know they're the ones behind everything. Uh, I know you're not supposed to say uh, regime change anymore in this time of uh, like anti-neocon populism. Um, But I've been a regime change guy for uh, about a quarter century now. uh, And I'm not, uh, you know, I'm still in the same place I always was with this. I didn't understand back in uh, the Bush 43 days why when Iran was using its proxies to attack U.S. troops on the battlefield, our administration would only respond to the Iranian proxies in Iraq or where we found them. But for some reason, Iran's own homeland was off limits. And I I just don't understand that approach. They're the force behind all of this. uh, And I think we have to start dealing with them that way. And they're also in bed with the uh, corrupt socialist regime in Venezuela, which is a big factor in our border crisis. So yep. the idea that the Iranians aren't uh, hip deep in that uh, uh, problem is, is naive to, to suggest. So why is the Biden administration still trying to play nice with the Iranians? I know they're trying to not have a wider conflict, but the Iranians are directly involved in the conflict that exists. What's the incentive? What do, what do you think we can get out of Iran? Because we know what Iran thinks of us. Well, as I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, a person of uh, I'm a simple man of antediluvian attitudes, Greg. <laughs> and I'm an old regime change guy. Um, and I'm an old Biden's a moron guy. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Um, but, you know, it's not a joke, um, except on us, that it's been observed any number of times that he's been wrong on every single important foreign policy issue for half a century. You know, and I've, I've been hearing that articulation about him for about a quarter of a century. Um, and the only thing that ever changes about it is the, the marking of time. The fact that he is always wrong never changes. Um, and I, I must say, when you ask, why are we doing what we're doing? Um, we're not that far removed from, uh, you know, speaking of, of, of more of uh, Jim's great body of work in recent years, we're not that far removed from the debacle uh, in Afghanistan. And that happened singularly because of Biden. I mean, he he steered us into that against the advice of his top advisors, including his top military advisors, with everybody telling him if he went through with his plan it was going to be a debacle, which, of course, it, it turned out to be. Uh, and he was stubborn and mulish about it. And he insisted because he had a vision uh, of how the conflict sh- should end and his own expertise about the region 
that he just basically thumbed his nose at all the people who knew better, who was telling him, who were telling him, if you do this, this will be a, a, a real disaster. So flash forward, we're here, right? We're, I think, a week removed from the removal of all of the ballistic missile caps on Iran's ballistic missile activity, which was an intentional element of the JCPOA, the Obama administration's Iran nuclear deal that we now know Biden was a visionary in and had, you know, if that's the right word, um, and had a lot to do with in terms of the the uh, the whole framework of the deal and the administration's, the Obama administration's view of changing the American policy focus in the region to empower Iran and put distance between uh, us and Israel and us and our uh, more traditional, uh, it's, it, it probably overstates it to call them allies, but at least the, the good relations that we had or, or cordial relations we had with the Sunni Arabic states in the region. Um, and the Obama administration, I just think, took to a fair thee well, you know, took to the nth degree this ridiculous vision that the Beltway has followed since the 19, really since Khomeini, uh, that, you know, any minute now around the corner is going to come the rapprochement with uh, with Iran. Uh, and it's just going to be, you know, lovely when that all happens. And of course, it never happens because they hate us. Death to America is not like a mindless slogan. That's like their policy. Uh, but I think, you know, this is a long winded way of ask, answering the question you asked me. But I, I think that Biden is a stubborn, foolish man who has a vision of what that region should look like, which involves raising Iran up. Uh, and at some point, the magic moment is never exactly, you know, described what how we're going to know we've hit it. But there is suddenly going to be, you know, some kind of a, a an understanding between the United States and Iran uh, and they're not going to be a problem for us anymore. And the region is going to be much more tidy. And I don't see any reason to believe that that's true. I've never seen any reason to believe that that's true. But I think Biden believes it in his bones. And they simply won't, you know, they won't walk that back. They won't say, you know, maybe maybe this is like a Jake Sullivan foreign policy essay. Like, you know, maybe it was all wrong. And I think that's their vision of this region is all wrong. When you think of the way this administration has ruined what is probably the most significant accomplishment of the Trump administration in foreign policy, other than turning Soleimani into a smear at the Baghdad airport, was isolating Iran through the Abraham Accords. I think that was the main idea between, um, with that whole operation, with the Saudis tacitly blessing it uh, from, from the shadows. And then this administration comes in, blows it all up to try and resurrect Obama's legacy, but um, might go deeper than that with, with the way Biden uh, incorrectly sees the world. I don't know. Yeah. You, well, I think you're entirely right about that, because between the Abraham Accords and Trump's maximum pressure policy, you were actually dealing with Iran in the language Iran understands, which is to squeeze it until it had no choice but to make accommodations and also to create the conditions on the ground uh, for the possibility, at least, of an uprising by the Iranian people against a regime uh, that I think it's it's probably true that they hate. This was the good martini, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, we'll have to get we'll have to get the bad news now. Huh? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, y'all! This is Sarah from the Sarah Carter Show. Thanks for listening to Three Martini Lunch. We all have a heartfelt reason to support our blood pressure. In fact, more than half the U.S. population would benefit from blood pressure support. Superbeats Heart Shoes are an easy and convenient way to support healthy blood pressure and promote heart-healthy energy. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Superbeats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. And believe me, I know because I'm traveling all over the country covering stories and frankly, sometimes all over the world. And it's so easy. I just keep my super beats in my handbag, in my pocket, wherever. And I've got amazing energy. And guess what? They taste really good. So supporting healthy blood pressure comes with a bonus. Super beats, heart shoes support healthy circulation. So you not only get 
Blood pressure support, you also get a productive, heart-healthy energy without the crash. Double your potential with Superbeat Heart Chews. Get a free 30-day supply of Superbeat Heart Chews and 15% off your first order by going to GetSuperBeats.com and using promo code Sarah. That's S-A-R-A. GetSuperBeats.com, code Sarah, to get 15% off your first order. GetSuperBeats.com, promo code Sarah. Well, let's talk about our bad news now. And this, Andy, is certainly in your wheelhouse. Uh, The ongoing investigation, really on Capitol Hill, of the Biden family seems to be the one generating the most progress. And now we know why. Uh, Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa, uh, who has worked with Ron Johnson and others to kind of dig into the Biden family uh, finances and their uh, work relationships, shall we say, and whether there's influence peddling and all this stuff, Well, uh, Senator Grassley, with a lengthy open letter, uh, basically saying he's heard from dozens of whistleblowers from the FBI that not only has the FBI and the Justice Department not been acting on the information that Congress is digging up and sending over for them to follow up on, but they're actively shutting things down, not acting on it, deliberately making sure that uh, they don't follow up on it and, and figure out what the what the truth is with some of the information that's coming out. So uh, for people who think that uh, Merrick Garland is basically carrying the Biden's water, this is not going to come as a as a huge surprise. But uh, Andy, what do you make of what Grassley is saying here from the whistleblowers? And uh, what, if anything, can you do about it? Well, it doesn't surprise me, Greg, given the nature of the evidence that we've seen. It, you know, the House committee is now they don't have the investigative resources that the Justice Department does. And with the limited time and resources that they have, they've in the last less than a year shown twenty four million dollars going into the Biden family coffers between just twenty fourteen and twenty nineteen. So it's it shouldn't be surprising that there are a lot of people who were reporting suspicious things uh, because it seems like we have an abundance of suspicious things. And let's remember that most of the investigation that the House has done, uh, that information, what triggered a lot of that inquiry, uh, were suspicious activity reports from banks, which suggests that these guys felt like they were invulnerable and were doing a lot of things that a lot of people would have found suspicious, uh, figuring they were going to get away with it. So I'm not surprised to hear that a lot of people were reporting troubling aspects of uh, Biden and potential foreign corruption. I think the thing that we need to find out, is this an institutional problem at the FBI or is this like a combination of a colossal FBI screw up of, of the kinds that we've seen over the years, combined with some, uh, you know, truly bad actors who are actually trying to bury Biden information. The jury's still out on that. But my own view of this, for what it's worth, is that after 2016, where you had the whole Hillary investigation and the Trump investigation and the bureau kind of in the middle of it all, uh, and I'm not I'm not making an apology for the way the Bureau uh, treated all that, uh, far from it. But I do think that um, they did feel uh, like they were stuck in the middle of a fraught political situation and that it was it turned out to be very damaging for the Bureau and that it would have been damaging no matter what they had had done. Uh, I don't know that I agree with that assessment, but I do have sympathy for the fact that they did have these investigations uh, dumped into their lap. Although I think the Russiagate one was more of a manufactured investigation than anything else. But I do think after 2016, they had this view that, uh, and certainly Attorney General Barr uh, was was pushing this, that uh, unless you had a very serious crime, like convincing evidence of a serious crime, the Justice Department and the FBI should not be involved in electoral politics. There may have been an overcorrection there. I think that there was an inclination uh, in the FBI to not see the signs of a financial corruption scheme, uh, even when they were plain, because it would have inevitably uh, and inexorably tied the Bureau into yet another fraud political scandal 
and have a lot of people saying the Bureau would have been the ones who were deciding a presidential election. And they clearly didn't want to be in that position. And I've seen what the Bureau is like when those signals get sent from above. So I do think they may have been bending over backwards to not affect the election because of what a debacle 2016 was. And I do think that that probably opened the door for some truly bad actors like this guy Thebolt, who was the um, the chief of the Bureau's Washington field office, who was running point on a lot of the uh, of the Biden stuff, and who we know on the basis of information that uh, Senator Grassley has dug up over the last year, uh, he's now not with the Bureau anymore. They they persuaded him he should spend some more time with his family. From what what we've seen with uh, what Grassley has put out. Uh, he took pretty extraordinary steps to try to bury the Biden investigation and probably the Hunter investigation as a subset of the Biden investigation. So I think you may have a combination of overcorrection and some bad actors, but we need to do a lot more investigation. Now, Andy, you're a seasoned prosecutor. And one of the things we learned recently from the House investigation is that after President Biden dared investigators to find the money, uh, show me the money about how he somehow profited from his family's uh, activities, uh, they turned up a check where his brother uh, cut him a check for $200,000. Now, in the memo, it says loan repayment. And so as a result of that, you got everybody from the frauds at the Lincoln Project to every Democratic talking head out there saying, look, it's obviously on the up and up. It's a loan repayment. Now, as a criminal prosecutor, uh, do people ever not tell the truth when they write in the memo of a check that they probably wish hadn't been discovered? <laughs> well, not only that, Greg, I think that you're, what you're trying to show here is that we have a common thread. Maybe it's a, like a, a, a common olive jar or something between our uh, our martinis, because after my rant on the first one, I now have to move on to Joe Biden on the second martini and say how shocked, shocked I am that somebody who says stupid things about the stupid things he has done appears to have said something stupid about something stupid that he did. Um, and but I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Most of what Biden has said, you know, this again, I, I'm, like this is Ocam's razor, right? You get a you get a guy who is not a p particularly bright guy. And for 50 years, he says dumb things about the major issues of the day. Now, flash forward 50 years and he is president. Um, the fact that he is the issues of the day doesn't make him any smarter and any less liable to, to say things that are really galactically stupid. So, you know, at the beginning of all this, he said that, um, you know, he had no contact with his son about business matters, which on its face was preposterous. I mean, I, you know, I, I have contact with my sons all the time about the stuff that they're doing. Sure. The idea that, you know, why wouldn't he have that? Um, so to categorically say that he just didn't discuss business with his son was never uh, was never tenable, particularly when the son was taxiing uh, across the oceans to to do business on Air Force Two with dear old dad when he was going to meet the Chinese. I mean, the idea that, you know, on the 15 hour flight on the way to China, they didn't mention business. You know, you know, he also said that the, the his son never made a dime from the you know, from the Chinese, which on its face, I mean, we now know that like in just a, a, a calendar year between 20, was it 27, uh, 2016 into 2017, uh, the Biden family took $6 million in from the Chinese just on the CEFC venture. So, you know, he's one of these guys who's not a particularly swift, bad actor, who is doing what not particularly swift bad actors do, which is you say stupid things. And then when the facts show those things to be wrong, you mend what you've said until the next thing shows that the mending was wrong. Uh, and I just think we're going to see this with Biden. Uh, and my theory about this for what it's worth is that a lot of the bad activity here we're going to see and a lot of the dopey things that Biden is saying uh, pertain to this period. But I think in 2016, they were absolutely sure that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election and be the next president uh, and that she was going to have a, an eight year run as president so that Biden's political career was effectively over. And they he had basically turned his attention to cashing in 
on the at the end of his political career because they thought that really was the end of his political career and it was the pinnacle he was going to reach as vice president so it was time to cash in and i i don't think they thought about him running for president until it was clear that uh, you know trump shocked everyone by beating hillary and then biden got the idea some sometime after that to uh, that he would run. But I think in that period of time when they thought his political career was done, they did a lot of sloppy things. Well, let's focus on our sponsor for today, and that is for Patriots, makers of many excellent products, including the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. Look, you need power at your home, and you just don't know when it's going to get knocked out. If you're near a place where a hurricane could come ashore or tornadoes in the spring, You never know who's going to hit a power pole in your neighborhood. You just don't know. So be prepared with the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. Solar generators, if you didn't already know this, charge more devices for longer in a blackout. And the uh, Patriot Power Generator 2000X now has new expandable capability for even more power. Be ready in case the power goes out at home so you have a functioning fridge, freezer, medical devices, and a whole lot more. It's fume-free, silent, and safe. Comes with a solar panel, 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Visit 4 slash martini to see this week's discounts and deals before they are gone and to get free shipping on orders over $97. Save more and get peace of mind now by going to the number 4 slash martini. That's 4 slash martini. All right, Andy, let's move to our other major legal caper of the day. This seems to have been resolved yesterday with New York Democratic Congressman Jamal Bowman uh, pleading guilty to a misdemeanor for pulling that fire alarm in the Cannon House office building uh, during the Saturday debate over the bill to keep the government open until mid-November. He had said that uh, he was just trying to get to the Capitol so he could cast a vote and uh, he was having trouble opening the door that's usually open. Well, coincidentally, the same day he makes his plea, uh, the video is released of what actually happened that day. He didn't try to open the door at all. He removed the signs explaining that an alarm would sound uh, if the door was open because there are different rules on the weekend. And then he very deliberately pulled the fire alarm. So his story is not true. I don't know what he told prosecutors, but he also said yesterday he made a deal with the D.C. attorney general. He'd pay the fine. And within a couple of months, this wouldn't even be on his record anymore. So you got a lot of people on the right saying, hey, a couple of years ago, if you had people coming in there and disrupting uh, business, uh, that was uh, enough grounds to keep you in jail until you're uh, your hearing, and then uh, you could get several years in the pokey after that. So, uh, Andy, I know you've written about this. What's your take on the Bowman saga? Well, I'm shocked to see that he's lying. <laughs> so, I think this is a this is a weasel deal, if ever there was one. You know, first of all, the last point that you made is quite right. I mean, you have hundreds of people who actually didn't do anything violent. Um, who were prosecuted by the Justice Department for obstruction of a congressional proceeding simply because they were loitering in a place where they weren't legally allowed to be. Um, And a lot of those people who went through the Capitol and were prosecuted uh, went through the Capitol long after members of Congress and the vice president had been ushered out of there. Um, And some of them, as we've later learned, were actually even waved in by the police. That doesn't mean they should have gone in. But but, you know, I mean, these people, uh, because the Democrats wanted to make a domestic terrorism narrative out of the Capitol riot uh, and wanted to make an example of the January 6th defendants, a lot of these people were charged with obstruction of a congressional proceeding, which is a 20 year felony rather than either not being charged or being charged with like misdemeanor loitering or something, which would have been more of a measure of what they had actually done. So now flash forward, we have this um, member of Congress uh, who is a knowledgeable guy who was acting absolutely willfully uh, under circumstances where Democrats were trying to delay a vote. And he took a willful action to delay the vote, which clearly obstructed a congressional proceeding. That's what he should have been charged with. And I think my own view of this, just because I'm, I'm probably more cynical than most uh, when I see the law enforcement process being abused the way it is, Democrats only prosecute Democrats to protect Democrats. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but by giving him this slap on the wrist that, they, that the D.C. authorities gave him, he will have an argument to make if he's ever... If, 
if a real Justice Department ever comes in and tries to prosecute him for obstructing Congress and for lying to the the authorities, if they try to prosecute him, he will argue double jeopardy. He'll say that he's already been prosecuted by uh, the D.C. authorities. And Washington, D.C. is different from the states. Washington, D.C., of course, is not a state. It's a federal district. And the reason that that's relevant is if you were in New York and you committed a crime and you were prosecuted by and it happened to be a crime, let's say, like narcotics dealing that that has uh, that both the feds and the states have jurisdiction. The fact that the state prosecuted you would not bar the federal government from prosecuting the same crime under federal law because we have what's known as the du- the dual sovereignty exception to double jeopardy. The states and the feds are separate sovereigns, so the double jeopardy only protects you by a prosecu- for, from a prosecution uh, by the same sovereign for the same crime that you've already been uh, prosecuted for. So in the states, the feds can, can do a prosecution after the state authority uh, has already done, this, uh, done the same crime. In Washington, the only sovereign is the federal government. So Bowman will be able to argue that because he's already been prosecuted on this for pulling the fire alarm, that the Justice Department can't come around like a year or two later and try to prosecute him for obstruction of Congress. When I say they they gave him the minimal deal they could have given him, he has to pay a $1,000 fine. Um, I'm not sure how, how... much of a guilty plea this actually was, because as I understand it, the ch- what they're saying is that the charge is going to be dropped in three months, uh, as long as he doesn't pull another fire alarm, I imagine. <laughs> um, and if the charge is going to be dropped, that suggests that he wasn't actually prosecuted on it, like the record will, will be totally expunged. So I'm not sure this is even a situation where he entered an actual guilty plea. I think it may have been adjourned in contemplation of dismissal. What confuses me is the fine, because if a fine was imposed, that would usually be in connection with an actual conviction. But he's saying that, you know, the weasel deal he made with this prosecutor is that the conviction, if it is one, is going to disappear in three months. So I think what happened here was the Democrats, again, trying to take care of their own. They gave him the minimal deal that they could give him. They wouldn't have prosecuted him at all, except he needed a prosecution to sort of protect him from a future prosecution if a real Justice Department tries to charge him with what he did, which was obstruction of Congress. I think you gave us the line of the day, Andy. Democrats only prosecute Democrats to protect Democrats. (laughs) It's true. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So that'll take that with you into the weekend. Andy, always great to have you with us. And uh, how about this? How about this, Greg? Biden should start saying that because that would be something that is not only smart, it couldn't be disproved. (laughs) Oh, Andy, thanks so much for your time. Always great to have you. Thank you, Greg. Andrew C. McCarthy, former chief assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, contributing editor at National Review Online. He's also a Fox News contributor. Oh, and don't forget about his fantastic book about the Trump-Russia situation called Ball of Collusion. If you haven't already read that, check it out. Uh, Jim Garrity should be back on Monday. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, Please subscribe to the podcast. If you don't already, tell some friends about us as well. Thanks for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us all on Twitter, or X, I guess it's called now. Andy is at Andrew C. McCarthy. Uh, Jim is at Jim Garrity, and I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a terrific weekend. Join us again on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.